Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the By Word Show. So glad you're here. Wow. We are in week 11 of the Love is Mini series. And before I get started, I just have to say, oh my goodness, this past week has been a doozy, y'all. <laughs> it has been wild. So last Monday, I was actually traveling home from Australia. And this whole past week, I've just been catching up from jet lag, plus pregnancy, plus all of the things and just life in general being wild and crazy. Um, but I'm excited to sit down with you here. It's the end of the day over here when I'm recording this, but I am really excited. Like I said, these last few really are so rich. And so I'm really excited to dive in today. <music> Today, we're talking about how love never loses faith. This is, like I said, week 11. And some translations also say love believes all things or love always trusts. So when I was looking into this one, I found that the original Greek meaning for the context of this verse in 1 Corinthians 13 means to be committed to and to have confidence in the goodness of men, which I I thought was actually really interesting. And so I did some more digging and found that basically what that what Paul is talking about here in this passage is to assume the best in others or to give people the benefit of the doubt. I also read that the Greek used in this passage can be translated, love believes the best in every situation. So while I was researching, I came across this article that I thought was really fascinating. And it says, that does not mean love accepts truth for every last thing or believes absolutely everything. That is folly, not love. And they're referencing this verse, love never loses faith. Love believes all things, always trusts. So it's saying that we're we're not naive about it, right? Like we're not just going into this blind. We we want to use wisdom in relationships, right? We want to have discernment. And so I I love how they said it's not that it's not that we accept everything as truth, right? That is folly. That's that's really not love. That's not what we're talking about here. It's just so important for us to remember that love isn't an attitude of passivity, of tolerance, excusing people's sin. In my opinion, this is more about acknowledging the brokenness and the struggles and imperfections and then choosing to see the best in others anyway. As always, Jesus is such a great example of this. He spent time with people that today most would label as toxic or less than inferior, like the outcasts, right? And he hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, the social outcasts, sick people, rich snobs. He saw them. He chose them. He loved them. He healed them. But something that stood out to me recently is the fact that after Jesus healed these people or spoke truth over them saying, you are healed, you are well, you know, whatever it is. He immediately followed it up with now go and sin no more. I think this is so powerful because y'all know <laughs> how, how much I get into this mindset stuff, right? And I've talked about this on the show a million times. If you are not familiar with all of my thoughts on mindset, one of our first episodes is Mindset 101, just everything you need to know about the breakdown of the progression that starts in our thoughts, influences our feelings, desires, words, actions, and creates our overall behavior. And I've just found that in the church or in the world, even I find this even in parenting, we get so focused on people's behavior. We get so frustrated with people's behavior without realizing that it's really an identity issue. It's a belief issue that's prompting the progression that leads to those words, actions, and behaviors. So coming back to what Jesus did here that I think is so cool. Number one, he spent time with them first. He got to know people. He took time to acknowledge and see their hurts and their needs so that he knew how to meet them. And I'm not saying that Jesus was in a super deep relationship with every single person he came in contact with or healed or helped, right? But he always took the time to notice people and see them and meet them right where they were, which I think is really cool and just like sounds so simple, right? But it's something that we easily forget. And we've, it's kind of been a theme this whole time, right? Like loving people well means slowing down enough to take notice of other people and their needs and realize how we can meet them in small ways and big ways and in between, right? So that was number one. Number two, 
Jesus actually took the time to see them and become aware of their needs so that he could speak the truth and do the healing that they actually needed. And this is kind of the same as number one, but really I just wanted to emphasize the point that he really knew them. Like he looked at their behaviors. He saw the manifestations of sin or brokenness in their bodies. And I don't mean that in a woo woo way. Like I just mean he recognized, okay, this person is hurting. This person is broken. This person is prideful. This person is, you know, like missing something. And then once he recognized that he knew exactly what to say to them in order to heal them and change their lives. And I'm not just talking about people who are sick, right? Because we see all throughout scripture, how Jesus healed people. And then he would say, okay, go and sin no more. I'm talking about people like Zacchaeus, even, you know, like this rich guy who had it all no issues, right? Jesus said, Hey, I want to come and spend time with you. And just being around Jesus made Zacchaeus realize, okay, (laughs) I've not been living right. I want to make changes. I want to make this right. And then same thing, Jesus spoke truth to him and he said, okay, go send no more. Like the interactions with Jesus, where he spoke truth to people, where he healed them, where he changed their lives. It was a pivotal moment for them. And I think that is something that is so powerful about his love because when we experience God's love, it meets us where we're at and then prompts us to change. Because I think a lot of frustration in our relationships is wanting people to change and waiting for them to change, but we will always end up disappointed. We will always end up frustrated when we have that approach to relationships. So we just have to remember that if somebody is acting kind of like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, acting out of alignment with their true character, what can we do to speak truth? What can we do to encourage? What can we do to remind them of who they really are so that they can make a change in their thoughts, which kind of redirects the entire progression, right? Because think about it. Why, why do people sin? Why do people make choices that aren't great for them? And let's just break this down real quick because we all sin, right? I'm not just talking about the stuff that we hear in church. That's like, don't do this. Don't do that. This is not okay. This is not allowed. This is not X, Y, Z. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sin, like across the board, which let's just get on the same page real quick, break it down. Sin is making a choice to go your own way instead of choosing God's best for your life and going against what he says is right and good. And so we all sin all the time. Like this could be trying to be in control of every situation and not trusting God. It could be living in fear rather than trusting that God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. It could be, you know, making choices that are not good for your mind or your body. It could be a huge, huge, huge variety of things. But at the heart of it, it's us making a choice or believing that we know better. And that's what gets us stuck. And Jesus noticed this. So he knew how to speak truth and kind of going back to those, (laughs) that, that the steps of what I thought was so powerful. Number three, like after he saw people. He spent time with them. He saw their need. He spoke to their need. He met their need and then gave them the command to go and change the way you're living. (laughs) Like they realized finally what their need was and who was able to meet their need. And then he told them, okay, now you know the truth. So let's keep moving in this direction. And I love that because again, going back to the mindset progression, it amazes me how Jesus first addresses the, their soul, which is the mind, will, and emotions. And that's the part of the progression, which is our thoughts, feelings, and desires, right? And then once he addressed what was going on in their mind, will, and emotions, he addressed their actions, which is the go and sin no more. He didn't start with the behavior. He didn't start with saying, stop sinning. He, he loved them. He met them. He saw them first, and then he addressed the action, which was their behavior. And, and that I think is what's going to cause a shift for us because I've just noticed in the church, how much people kind of have a bad taste in their mouth because they've been in church settings or they've had conversations with Christians who have just harped on their choices. Like you're not dressing modest enough. You don't need to live this way. Don't, 
go this far in your relationship with your boyfriend. You know, so many things where it's behavior focused and that turns people off to God because that's just not who he is. There's so, there's, it's just so much deeper, right? Like there's a root to every behavior. It's not just someone blatantly wanting to rebel. I mean, (laughs) there's always something that they're believing. Like going back to why people sin, if you think about somebody who's living in sin, it's like a reflection of what's really going on in their hearts and minds. And most of the time, they're usually believing things about themselves or about God that are not true. That's why I think the way Jesus approaches hurting people and broken people is so powerful. Because coming back to what all this has to do with love, I, well, I just want to share something really quick that I wrote in one of my old journal entries, one of the past times that I was going through the study. I wrote, in relationships, we should be giving life, calling out the best in others, encouraging and building others up. If this isn't happening, it's probably draining on one or both people, which makes choosing love harder. Uh, yes. Uh, (laughs) I can say that still rings true for me today. It is so hard to choose love when one or both people just feels like they're being drained in a relationship. You know what I mean? And so when we stop getting so hung up on people's behaviors, I mean, I think about this even with my son who's three. I'm like, okay, why is he acting out this way? He probably has an unmet need or he's trying to communicate something that he doesn't really know how. And we're like that as adults too. (laughs) You know, like if I'm acting out, if I'm having a hard day, I'm going to say and do things that are not, not the best, like don't reflect the best on me. And it's usually because I am believing that I am running behind in life, that I have something to prove that, you know, negative thinking about myself, about my body, about my mind, about my work, about whatever, fill in the blank. And it, it catches up to me every single time. Like as soon as it starts coming out in my words and my behaviors, the way I treat people, the way that I speak to myself, I have to catch myself. And this is something where I'm continually in a learning process. I have to catch myself and remember what, where, where's this coming from? What am I thinking right now? That's starting this progression of negative words and desires and behaviors and actions, you know, and then I have to retrace it and get back in alignment with truth. Because nothing about my behavior will really change if I'm not changing the way that I'm thinking. So, okay, I'm trying not to go off on a huge mindset tangent here. Let's bring it back in. To sum all of this up, when it comes to love, believing all things, and holding on to faith, we are called to love the way that God loves us, right? And he sees us through the lens of what Jesus has done. It, It means that when God looks at us, he doesn't just see our sin and our brokenness. He actually sees us whole and restored and redeemed and righteous and good because he's looking at us through what Jesus has done. Like that's the filter that God is seeing us. That is how he loves us. And he, he isn't focused on our outward behavior. The Bible talks about how man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God looks at the root. He re- he looks at the core of who we really are. He is much more concerned about the state of our heart and our minds than whether we're behaving perfectly or whether we have it all together. Do you know what I mean? And it just, that's the perspective that we should be taking as believers when we are in relationship with others, when we are interacting with people throughout our days, giving them the benefit of the doubt, assuming the best in them. I'm sure you've heard it before, but you just never know what somebody is going through. You may be in line at the drive through or in the checkout line at the grocery store and the cashier is just rude to you. But remember that the way that people are acting, the words that they're saying are a reflection of what's going on in their heart and in their mind. So maybe just pause for a second and realize, okay, I can't take this personally because I have to realize like they're probably going through something. They are probably in a negative, sad, like dark, heavy mindset that's causing all these things, you know? And then we assume the best in them and we extend love and kindness because that's what Jesus does for us. He looks at us through a different filter. We we have to choose to look at others the same way. I've referenced this in so many episodes since this, but the, the one I did with Aurelia Pratt, she said something so profound and it's that once you realize that you are created in the image of God and that you are 100% totally fully loved and forgiven by him, it's impossible to not see others that way. Like 
we are all made in the image of God. We are all fully loved, fully forgiven. He chose us despite our mess, (laughs) knowing that we would continue to make mistakes and go our own way sometimes. So to wrap this up, I have a challenge for you this week. I've been forgetting some of these weeks, but in the book, if you're following along, there is a challenge every single week that goes along with what we're talking about. So this week for week 11, the challenge is honestly such a good one, just a tool to have in your arsenal. It's something that has helped me so much throughout my life. And since we're talking about how love never loses faith, it believes all things, it's important to actually know what the truth is so we know what to put our faith in, right? So this week, I just want to encourage you to take some time, whether it's a couple minutes or like, you know, an hour, whatever is realistic for you, but just look up some verses that realign your focus on truth. It could be verses about what God says about you, or it could be verses that help you remember how God sees other people in your life. But the the point here is really that when we start to get the truth into our hearts about the way God sees us, it makes it so much easier for us to be able to then see the best in others. That's all I've got for you today, my friend, but I hope you have an amazing week and I will see you right back here next Monday for week 12. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to tune into another episode of the By Word Show. I love having you here and I'm so thankful for your support. Don't forget to share a screenshot of this episode to let me know you were here. I can't wait to talk again soon, but in the meantime, be sure to come hang out with me on Instagram and remember, I am cheering you on.